Okay, one more minute and we'll finish allowing people to join. If you've just joined, please uh, leave your microphone on mute and your video off. We would appreciate that. And again, as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. Okay, I think we're good to go. Um, let's get started. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. It's, as I mentioned, it's lunchtime here on the East Coast. So if uh, you're enjoying your lunch uh, during this time, sit back, relax, and uh, we hope you gain some knowledge from this meeting. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to, to today's joint webinar hosted by NUARI, which is Norwich University Applied Research Institutes, Innova Law Group, and Meridian Strategic Services. Uh, we, will, we will be addressing the first 24 hours crucial decision-making during a cyber attack. Uh, let's get introductions out of the way. Uh, since I'm speaking, I'll go ahead and introduce myself first. Uh, my name is Jaken Hayes. I'm the Senior Strategic Communication Specialist for Nuari. I've been with Nuari for about a year now. I have a background in journalism. Um, and I will be leading us through the webinar today. Um, I am also a Norwich University class of 94, so I've kind of come full circle back at home. Um, and just as a side note, this is the first time I've hosted a webinar, so please bear with me if I make a few mistakes. I'm uh, not the best at Zoom, but uh, hopefully uh, the panelists and uh, could guide me through if I uh, encounter any speed bumps. So uh, let's start off with some introductions. I'm going to go ahead and um, start sharing the screen uh, and we'll meet our group. So I should be sharing the screen now. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So uh, for our first introduction, we have John Kennedy. He is a Nuari cybersecurity advisor. I'm not going to bore everyone by reading all of these slides. I'll let you go ahead and uh, skim through them. But um, just briefly, John has helped create, plan, and deliver emergency management exercises for agencies in the public safety and healthcare fields. Um, and as I mentioned, he's with Nuari, a little background on Nuari up on the screen now. Um, we're a 501c3 nonprofit corp that uh, is a global leader for more than a decade in developing cyber wargaming, distributed learning technology, distributed simulation technology, critical infrastructure exercises, and cybersecurity curriculum. Next up, we have Heidi Fessler. She's a cybersecurity and data privacy attorney. She's with Innova Law Group. As you can read, she acts as a cyber and privacy counsel for companies of all types with a special focus on healthcare and healthcare adjacent companies. And she acts as a virtual privacy officer for a medical device company. There's a little bit more on Innova Law Group. I'll go ahead and give you a second or two to skim over that. And again, these slides could and will be made available to you upon request after the webinar. Next up, we have Seamus Leary. He's the president of Meridian Strategic Services. Um, Seamus has a track record of building diverse multifunctional teams, enhancing their capacity, overcoming the challenges presented by crisis situations in complex environments. A little bit more about Meridian. And just as a side, Seamus and I went through Norwich together, both proud, <laughs> proud graduates of the class of 94. So we You're a brave man to admit that, Jim. <laughs> I'm proud, proud to admit that. So we've just had a couple uh, folks join in with us. And uh, if I could ask you to mute your microphones and keep your video off, that would help us with this webinar. 
So now that we're done with introductions, we're going to go ahead and kick things off with Heidi. She's going to delve into uh, framing the risk. Thanks, Jake. And so I want to talk today about, well, first off, I want to thank you all for joining us on our inaugural webinar. And of course, be kind to us regarding our, if we have any technical glitches, since we're new at this. I want to talk to you a little bit about the risk that businesses face today. Most a lot of businesses don't think that they have a lot of risk regarding cyber possibilities or cyber attacks. And a lot of times that stems from the companies not believing that they would be a really attractive target for a cyber criminal. We know that any company can become a victim of cyber criminals or cyber hacking actions, but we also know that the big companies that have a lot of people and a lot of resources devoted to defending against these types of attacks still get hit. Colonial pipeline, um, every day there's a new data breach or a new ransomware attack or a new malware attack that we hear about. And they're not always the biggest companies. But it, what I do know is it can happen to any size company. It can be the smallest company, a single person company, where somehow their emails compromised and they, the people who compromise it get in there and send out invoices to all of that business's customers or clients, diverting the funds over to um, the criminal, to large companies or healthware companies where potentially ransomware can get in and lock down the EMR, making it hard for them to treat their patients. So let's talk a little bit about small to medium-sized businesses, as that's really what we're trying to focus on. They don't get enough love in this area, so we're giving them some love today. What we do know is that small and medium-sized businesses account for 43% of all data breaches. So that's a significant amount. And that 66% of company, healthcare companies hit by ransomware in 2019 45% of them paid that ransom and half of those never were able to recover their data. So the best way to handle this is to have a good process and policy in place to address this when it happens. So that's what we're here for today. But we also know that there has been a 600% increase in COVID related phishing attacks in just Q1 of 2020 and 240 2% increase in cyber attacks against small medium-sized businesses just from 2019 to 2020. Those numbers are understating it. It has only went up for COVID and remote workers. And 61% of small medium businesses had a cyber attack last year. And here's something I want you to think about. Those that had a cyber attack, those are the ones who knew they had a cyber attack. That's not the ones who didn't know. I've worked with some big companies when they had a major breach. And they said to me, we've never had a data breach before. And I thought, yes, you have. You just weren't looking for it. So you didn't realize that. And for healthcare, over 3 million healthcare records were breached each month on average from July 2020 to June 2021. That's a lot of risk out there. So the threat is real. And we're going to discuss today what you need to do in those first 24 hours after a breach after an event has happened. And before we go on, we're gonna send out to everybody on our call and everybody who registered, the checklist that we suggest you use for the first 24 hours. And it's really, I've used this, I created it, but we all worked on it. I've used this when working with my clients, I'm oftentimes the first call. And so this is a great guide that's gonna make sure that you understand before you actually have an event, these are the questions you're going to have to answer, and these are the activities you're going to have to take. Thanks, Chicken. Wonderful. Thanks, Heidi. I'm going to uh, go ahead and stop sharing the screen now. And uh, you did a great job of really framing that risk, bringing to attention uh, the importance. And so let's uh, transition now over to Seamus, and he can really dive deep down into the first steps after uh, the event is, or after the event occurs. Thanks, Jake. Um, I'm just going to review some uh, basic um, incident management uh, principles that really apply to a lot of different situations. 
and that, that includes cyber, including a cyber event. You know, cyber event in many ways is like a, a serious crisis or, or any other disaster. There are certain principles that apply uh, in most events and organizational leaders uh, should employ them when they're confronted by a, a, a cyber event. No matter what the emergency is, it's critical that every organization have a system in place to manage a significant incident. In the public safety sector, which is much of my background, it's called the Incident Command System, or ICS. And I'm going to touch on some of those basic principles of ICS as they relate to cyber events this morning. It's critical that all organizations have at least a basic plan in place to respond to a crisis. This plan should be created, socialized, and tested well before a potential cyber event or any other incident. A plan isn't a guarantee of success, but it provides a basic common understanding of how a response and recovery effort could or would work. Adjustments can always be made to the plan based on conditions of the on the ground. Training on the plan for the entire team is crucial as well. This includes utilizations of job action sheets, checklists like Heidi just mentioned, to remind every member of the team what their role and what their duties are in the potential or ongoing event. Obtaining situational awareness is also a really another key uh, element of, uh, of ongoing operations. And it's a guide and it provides information um, that serves as a guide to future operations. Early on, it's important for leaders to understand what are the knowns involved in the situation? Many might've heard of these before, but these, you know, the knowns are what are known information, things that we know, we, we have known unknowns, um, which we will move to and we'll endeavor to move them into the known column. And finally, we have the unknown unknowns, which we always have to account for because they can have an impact uh, in an unforeseen way while we're trying to stabilize the situation. So the more, the more knowns we have through the planning process, the more able we're account, we might be able to account for the unknown unknowns as we move forward. It's also important to recognize situations can change and in the cyber environment that that pace of change can be very, very rapid and keeping pace with the situation can be challenging. So while we're obtaining situational awareness, we have to avoid being a, uh, a, a condition that we call paralysis by analysis. And what that is, it's um, pausing, and, uh, pausing operations to while you uh, analyze, analyze the uh, operation instead of actually doing something. So sometimes developing 80% of the picture is good enough to act upon or at least to get operations going we can always refine things later. And sharing situational information with your partners is early is vital to maintaining trust and getting the help you need in a timely manner. One of the first things I like to do when um, I'm managing a crisis is to set initial objectives. Setting objectives and sharing them with the entire team establishes a unity of effort among everyone involved. These objectives can be shared and updated when needed, but it's also important to establish the unity of effort early on and having everyone work towards common goals. Once we set the objectives, um, or the functional team should be created by, you know, that work towards those objectives. The demands of any crisis, including cyber, may um, cause the establishment or pro of cross-functional teams designed to overcome the challenges of that particular event. The establishment of these cross-functional teams should be discussed long before the event, <clears throat> and, and these or functional teams may not be based on the organization's day-to-day -day management structure. This is why planning and training are so important. It's also important to order and procure needed people and resources as early as possible in a crisis. Often leaders are reluctant to request help and spend money without knowing the true extent of the event, or they, they may consider the event is just really not that big of a deal. Most of the time, it's, that's true. But not having the resources on hand that may be needed for some events can also cause catastrophic failure. Not getting the needed resources on hand early can cause organizations to play catch up. And unfortunately, many organizations can't catch up to the demands of a situation. When requesting help or bringing in additional resources, it's important not to create a crisis within a crisis. Having a plan to integrate incoming resources will ensure that they are effectively employed and to help the situation and not create an additional burden to the organization that could already be overwhelmed. And Despite its human nature to, uh, you know, a, a, a natural inclination to attack a problem head on when confronted by it until it's solved. And, it, and this might take days, weeks, or even months to sort out. That's why leaders need to have, need to pace themselves and their teams to ensure that they remain healthy, safe, and effective through the event. And as the situation matures, leaders 
must be willing to revise the, the organization's general strategy as well as the tactics employed to support that strategy based on the needs of the event. Leaders have to be prepared to pivot based on the success or failure of ongoing operations. And during a crisis, leaders must be effectively communicate up and down the organizational structure as well as laterally to partners and other stakeholders. In a cyber event, leaders must work closely with members of their team, as well as certain stakeholders like law enforcement to determine the boundaries of what should and should not be communicated internally and externally. And people like Heidi are, are critical in, in, in that conversation. But these boundaries, uh, but within the boundaries that we establish is crucial to be honest and as transparent as possible throughout the event and regarding the, the particulars of the incident. And finally, when it comes to a cyber event, leadership is really important. Leaders must lead because the consequences of indecisions in a fast-paced operational environment can be catastrophic to both the organization and have a significant negative impacts on external stakeholders. And with that, Jake, I'll turn it over back to you. Thanks. I do. Um... I, I, I do want to touch on something. Um, so, Seamus, you have a your background is in FEMA, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and so. Can you explain a little bit how dealing with a cyber incident is different than dealing with like a hurricane afterwards? Like, follow, you know, how to, how to deal with that cyber incident, the first steps versus like sure. a hurricane, which is what you're familiar with maybe. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. First and foremost, a cyber attack should not be considered an IT problem or an IT issue issue, which we see very often. It's a security event. It's, a, it, it's an incident that should be, uh, that can have an, a significant impact on the entire organization or even potentially the wider community, like we saw with JBS or we saw with Colonial Pipeline. Um, like most disasters and other similar events, a cyber attackers, the goal is to stabilize the situation and move to recovery as quick as possible. And that's no different from a hurricane or uh, a, a fire in a, in, a, in a facility or any, anything else that makes a significant impact. And in the process of stabilizing the situation after a cyber attack, organizations really will employ some of the same general incident principles, some of which I just went over, that we would in a hurricane or other significant event. That's establishing situational awareness, setting up obtainable objectives, task organizing, working to solve the problem with internal and external resources, and communicating effectively with stakeholders. So the bottom line, Jake, there are some differences, um, but there's a whole lot of similarities. Thank you. And uh, we do have a question uh, for you, Seamus. Uh, you mentioned uh, having some resources in advance. Um, can you give some examples of what some of those resources might be? Well, I, and I'll, I'll answer, help, hopefully Heidi will help me out in this, in this uh, question too, because she's- this Great, is really okay, what, question. <laughs> yeah, but um, you know, in, in, my, in my mind, you know, looking, you know, looking at resources in advance, this is, this, is the, this is the process of planning. So every organization is different. So when you're doing your hazard analysis and your risk analysis and your vulnerability analysis, some of these resources that you don't have on hand or you think you will need to have additional ones on hand uh, prior to the event, those are the ones we're really talking about. And I'll let Heidi get a little more specific on this one. And, and thank you for that uh, question uh, directed uh, to Seamus. And if anyone else has questions, be sure to pop them in down in the chat. And uh, as Seamus mentioned, um, we're going to transition over to Heidi now, and she's going to speak on third parties. Yep. Um, thank you, Jake. Um, so now third parties, who do you call? Why do you call them? When do you call them? There's a couple things you need to know about bringing third parties in when you have a cyber event. One, cyber events, unlike a hurricane, um, usually you're not really sure how long your event's been going on. So that's an important piece to understand. So you see the storm approaching, you know you have a hurricane coming. Oftentimes, by the time you have clear indicators that you've been implicated, that you have been victimized, you have no idea how long that hacker, that intruder, that malware has been within your system. So that brings me to another point. You need to know, and you well, first off, you need to know who's on your team, right? Internally, who's on your team? who is leading the team, and then who from outside is gonna be on that team. And the time to decide what lawyer to call, the time to decide what forensic investigator outfit to call is not when it's happened because oftentimes people turn to the lawyer that they know and that's great, lawyers are lawyers, but we're really specialized. So it's not something that you wanna to talk to the family law attorney you know, or even your business lawyer. 
they don't necessarily do this area. So why you call an attorney is if you want your investigation to be attorney-client privilege, you need to call an attorney. And that way it starts off as somewhat being protected, attorney-client protected. But then you already need to know who that is, how you're going to reach out to them, and that they agree that on an emergency basis, they will put everything else aside and come and help you. You also need to know who the forensic investigators are who are going to come in and help you decide and figure out what has happened. And like Shema said, that is not your IT's problem. IT is really specialized as well. And they keep the networks up, they keep them running, they think things, they keep things going well for your enterprise. They are not necessarily um, skilled at disassembling an attack and records that indicate an attack has happened. One thing I've had a lot of clients do is start pulling plugs. That's a really bad idea. Um, there might be a time you do pull the plug to cut the network, but it doesn't mean that's always the answer. So you need to have clear understanding of how you move forward once an attack has been declared. So you need to know your forensic expert. You need to know who your attorney is. You may need to know who's going to start speaking for the company or who's gonna help the company craft those messages. So you want to have that put together, assembled, know who they are, know that they're going to come and help, have those rates already agreed. I will tell you, uh, this is the cautionary tale. I had a very large multinational company that had a cyber event and they had a da large data breach. Their first answer was to use their internal IT team to take that data that had been compromised and put it someplace else and hide it. And then they wiped the servers. They wiped all evidence of how long the intruders had been in the system. So we had no way to say that in fact, nothing had been exfiltrated perhaps. We had no way to say what had been exfiltrated or accessed. So that's why you need to have somebody who comes in and, and knows how to forensically look at the systems and determine when this started. Um, a recent healthcare um, cyber event, ransomware attack actually that I worked on and led when we finally got the results of the forensic investigation and in, in that process, they put things back together. They used their business continuity plan and they restored their data. They were up and running, but long after they were back up and running, we discovered that the hackers had been within their system for six months. So that was, you know, there's a lot that can happen in six months. So you need to be sure that whoever you bring in has that understanding that they may need to preserve some data that otherwise would be lost by maybe well-meaning prompt action by people who don't understand the implication of that. And so you need to know that. And then you also have to know who's gonna talk. There's two, two streams of communication. One is internal and you cite your company. Are you gonna tell your employees? A lot of companies first step is let's not tell anyone. And that there's pluses and minuses to that. But internally, if your own team is finding out that they can't get into systems, that things are down, you just probably want to let them know we have an issue going on, we're investigating it, we'll keep you up to speed. And then are you going to let your customers know? Are you going to have an external communication? I used to say don't, you know, as an attorney, my first thing is don't admit anything. <laughs> <laughs> this is the strange area where I think it's your obligation legally if, for instance, a company hit by a phishing email that goes into the email systems and goes out to the entire address book with that malware as well, and it's coming from you as the trusted source. I don't know, you've probably all gotten one of those. You want your clients and customers or your patients to know so that they don't get compromised as well. Advising them in a really reasoned prompt way. I've done it for a couple of clients, got amazingly good results that no one else got compromised. And instead of making them feel like the company that they had dealt with was somehow deficient, it made them feel more trust because the company took that step within, and one company, it was within 24 hours. We had notified every single individual who likely also received the malware that they had the malware, what to do to remove it, that we cared about them. They got great responses, so it solidified their customer relationship. Back to you, Jake. 
Thank you very much. And those are some really good points. And um, I'd like to remind everybody that uh, we've compiled a checklist uh, that Heidi mentioned at the beginning of this meeting, and we will uh, make that available for distribution uh, following this meeting. Um, but I'd like to uh, bring Nuari now into the conversation and uh, John, and uh, he has a few thoughts on how to mitigate risk. Yeah, thanks, Jake. Um, mm -hmm. You know, first I'll, I'll I'll start with as we as we talk about the things and, and steps to take after you know right after a cyber attack. And, you know, as Seamus mentioned, I'll probably touch on a few things that both um, Heidi and Seamus mentioned. You know, there are some core things after any type of incident that you take a hurricane. And, you know, my background's in public safety, a fire. You know, and it's the ability to identify that there's an incident that's occurring. Um, you know, isolating the damage from that initial incident, containing things, um, and then you move into the, the mitigation and then the recovery portion of that. But every bit as important as that response is are the things that you do beforehand. Um, right. Again, a fire department can't, can't respond to an incident. They can't, you know, isolate, they can't put out a fire unless they've done things beforehand, such as training um, and things of that nature. So that's kind of where we're all come in. Um, because those things that you do are so critical to the first decisions that you make. Um, and, and, you know, what I'm talking about as, as you look at your organization and Seamus mentioned it, have you done a risk analysis threat assessment? Um, you know, my background again, tends to be in healthcare. So as I, as I talk to hospitals and, and organizations of that nature, do you know how many possible entry points you have into your networks? Um, you know, for hospitals, it can be hundreds and thousands um, depending on their size. And that, that goes for any organization. Um, you know, with COVID and people working from home, now you've created another set of entry points from people using their personal computers. Um, are they using their work computers to, to shop at Amazon? Are they getting on Facebook with their personal computers? Because now you've, you've added a whole risk there. Um, you know, do you have fire? And again, a lot of what, I, what I'll get are not necessarily answers, but they're questions for you to take back and, and ask yourself if you're a leader, um, if you're if you're not one of the leaders to ask your leaders and, and really help shape the picture of, of your organization, because that's really the first step. Um, you know, do you have firewalls separating your, your IT from your operational environment? Um, you know, again, where are you most, most vulnerable, vulnerable, excuse me, as an organization? What service lines, what business offerings do you have if they become corrupted will absolutely shut your business down? What can you work without? What can you work workarounds with? Um, you know, it comes down to I had a boss when I started a, a new job that I was kind of starting in running at a thousand miles an hour. And he told me I was going to be drinking from a fire hose. But he said, you know, you're starting into this position and because you're qualified, but you also don't know what you don't know right now. And, and so there's got to be room for that. And the same thing with your organization. A lot of times you don't know what you don't know with your organization. You don't necessarily know, you know, how you would respond to things. My wife, um, you know, for example, owns a business. Uh, a performing arts academy and she contracts she uses software for all of her billing for all of her attendance records and, and things of that nature um, you know if that software were to go down and she reached out to the co company that she's using where does she stand in their order of importance um, you know she's she's a, a medium size are there larger size businesses in front of her that are going to get treated first and get corrected first before her so as an, an organization you need to know those things as well um, you know, do you have the ability to ID that there's even been a, an issue like Heidi mentioned earlier? Um, do you have teams that are dedicated for that? If you don't, um, are you using outside resources, outside resources for that? Um, you know, do you have a monitoring system? That's one of the things that Noari does. We have a, a, an SSC where we, we monitor internal external traffic for organizations. And there's, you know, plenty of those things out there. Are you utilizing one of those? Um, so really, it comes back to that threat analysis identifying where you're, where you're weak, where you're strong, learning the things that you don't know in terms of capability about your organization. Um, and then, you know, kind of the next step to that is pre-planning and education, like Seamus mentioned. Once you've asked yourself those questions um, and, and hopefully have gotten as many answers for those, you kind of start on the next part of that is your pre-planning, taking the, the answers that you've learned and, and working those into a response plan and then educating your personnel. Um, you know, I think one of the interesting things that, that Heidi has mentioned and, and what we all hear, and a lot of businesses say, well, we've got monitoring software, we've, you know, we've got these things, um, these protections, um, and that's great, that's awesome, those are definitely steps you need to take, but most of the breaches that, that come for organizations come as a result of the employees. Um, you know, somebody clicks a bad link, um, you know, 
know, somebody opens an email, they shouldn't. Somebody responds to social engineering means on social media um, where they inadvertently give away a you know, mother's maiden name or, or their first car. Um, so all of those things are things that you need to be aware of and educate your people on it as you kind of create your plans. Um, you know, like how you said, as part of your plans, who do you reach out to in healthcare if you have a breach of, of protected health information? You know, do you know the reporting requirements for that when that information gets breached? Um, you know, for example, if, if it's less than 500 people, then you have a little bit of leniency when you report that. You have about 60 days after the end of the calendar year in which the breach happened, whereas opposed to if it's more than 500 people, you have 60 days to report that um, after the breach. And that's different for all types of information. If you're a credit agency, you know, do you know those regulations and have you built those into your plans also? Because when you come to the decision making after an event, when you've already built those into your plans, it makes those decisions kind of a one, two, three instead of, you know, a, a, well, who do we call? We don't really know yet. When you've built it and planned it um, and then educated on it, those decisions come easy. Um, and then kind of wrapping all of that together really to, to aid in the decision making is exercise and, is, and, and practicing those plans. Um, that really, you know, pulls all of that that together in terms of that. Thanks, John. And, you know, you've mentioned um, exercising and you've meant, and both you and Seamus both mentioned the known unknowns and trying to figure those out moving forward. Uh, you specifically mentioned employees and their behaviors in the cyber realm and how they could leave a company vulnerable or uh, open a door to an attack. Is there, you and I are both from Nuari and Nuari does have a way to assist organizations. Can you touch briefly on the exercises that Nuari uh, conducts? Yeah, sure. And, and I'll kind of go back a little bit, Jake, if you don't mind it, and hit a little yeah. bit more on, on exercising itself. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll do that first. So, so, you know, a lot of times people don't understand necessarily the need for exercising. People in public you know, public safety and, and, and you know, Seamus and FEMA kind of have a, a better grip of it. When you go and talk to, to private organizations, it, it can kind of be a little bit of a disconnect there. Well, they'll say, well, we've done, you know, we have annual training on our plans and, and, and you know, our plans are, are online and people can get them whenever they want. And that's good. That's, that's certainly a good thing to do. But if you're not exercising those plans, if you're not allowing your employees and your leadership is just an important too to take part of those, then you don't know how those plans are going to operate under stress. You know, I think everybody's heard the the old um, military saying that that all of your plans work and are great until the first shot's fired, and that's very true in any kind of incident, um, cyber, you know, a, a structure fire in the fire department, any kind of incident. Your plans are great until you put them in action under stress, and that's where exercising comes and, and plays such a crucial role. Um, you learn a lot of things when you when you exercise, and, and there's different exercises. There's tabletops where you kind of all get together and you can kind of throw stuff against the wall and see what sticks. And then there's functional exercising where you actually, you know, play out a scenario in, in, in real time and under real conditions. Um, and, and it's important to kind of do both of those. And what those do um, is it it answers those questions again that you might have already asked. You might have thought you had the answers for those. Um, and you've incorporated those into plans, but it puts your plans under stress. It puts your responses under stress. Um, and what I like to say is it really increases and helps strengthen the, what I call kind of the, the neural communication networks of an organization, right? Um, so when you, when you have an IT team and you give them a scenario or any other part of your team, you say, hey, this is what happened. You've identified it. Now, what do you do? And they start working the problem then they get involved with the decision makers in the C-suite and bring those in um, and force them to take part. And what you see sometimes is, you know, expectations that one group might have had for the other aren't really realistic. So a, a, a C-suite team and a leadership team might be thinking, well, you know, if we have a breach or a ransomware attack, our group and our IT or whoever is going to correct this in two hours and then we'll be good to go. And the group that's actually responsible for that says, no, this is a, this is a four-day event. Um, and that's kind of a shocking disconnect there that, that those exercises help, um, you know, kind of help alleviate. You know, other thing they do is, again, they help modify your plans. They help find those gaps, um, you know, and they help either confirm assumptions or, 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 or challenge those assumptions and force you to, to make 
different decisions and, and modify your plans based on that. Um, and one of the more important things as we talk about decisions and we talk about critical decisions after an incident, um, confidence in those decisions based on experience and practice is key. You know, when you're planning and you come kind of across a situation that you're not sure how to handle, I don't know is a, is a perfectly acceptable answer. Um, you can work with an I don't know in the pre-planning and the exercise phase. Um, and in some cases, an I don't know is even better than, than a straight answer because it gives your organization time to think. It gives your um, organization time to talk through certain scenarios. Again, the strengths of the communication um, and it creates confidence in those decisions. And, and so that's kind of what I'm getting to. Exercises and practicing creates confidence in the decisions that you have to make when you're under stress. And I would say too, I actually led two of my clients through this incident response process with Nuari, um, and they were healthcare and healthcare adjacent companies. And we simulated a ransomware attack. And it was a very, very valuable exercise for the companies. I think they went into it feeling like they knew everything and they came out of it going, you know, we do some things really well. But on those simulations, there was these huge pregnant pauses of, yikes. These people we thought knew this have no idea. And I will tell you that I've had, um, I went, I was four months into a massive breach um, response. And that was when they found the incident response plan <laughs> that they had. And apparently we hadn't followed it. So <laughs> it's not great not to follow what you have. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's so valuable to go through this because it forces you to know what you have, what you don't have and how it would work and also where your gaps are. It was a beautiful exercise to do when we didn't have um, the possibility of the business going down. One stat I did not give is that 60% of all small to medium sized businesses that experience a cyber attack will go out of business within six months of the attack. That's why it's super important that we get good at it. Right, and, and Jake, I'll answer question there. Sorry. I was going to say, well, I'll add a little bit. There and... and... <laughs> Go ahead, John. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, Jake, I was just going to hit the second part of your question. You mentioned Nuari um, and, and what kind of we do in the exercise space, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that. Um, so, yeah, at, at Nuari, we've created and developed with DHS funding a distributed exercise platform um, that we use. We work with organizations. Um, we work with financial organizations, industry, um, you know, industries and in, in, in the, the, the uh, transportation and energy, healthcare, all types of industries across the, the nation's infrastructure to help facilitate and plan those distributed um, exercises through our platform. Um, and so we, you know, we can work with uh, the planning groups of, of an organization, work with your SOPs um, and develop an, an exercise that you guys can take, take advantage of. You know, and, and just some of the things that we learned from that, you know, some commonalities just real quickly um, touch on again some of the things that Heidi mentioned. You know, we see a lot that there's a this can't happen to me attitude. Um, and, you know, we see that a lot. And it, it's better to go into the situation, this can happen to me. Um, now, what do I do when it does? Um, you know, the, another thing I touched on briefly is there's, we see sometimes a seat suite versus kind of working group disconnect. Um, again, where there's different expectations between working groups and C suite. Um, you know, the a working group may example for example, think that, you know, they're going to be allowed to work the issue and, and work it out. Whereas a C-suite might say, you know, even regardless of what Heidi mentioned, this is going to shut us down for four days. It's cheaper for us to pay the ransom. We'll pay the ransom. Um, and all of those things come out in the wash of exercises. And, and we're, really all of those things come down to, and the purpose of exercising is kind of a, is that lack of robust communications and communication networks within an organization that lead to good decisions. Um, and that's what the exercising does. That's what the whole process of the threat analysis, um, asking yourself the questions, creating the policies, and then exercising those do. It helps strengthen those, those pathways of communications. And quite honestly, when you do that for one, um, you know, one section, such as a cyber attack for business, it filters over and creates operational efficiencies for your entire business. Um, so you're not just improving in one area. When you create those pathways of communication, it creates efficiencies all across your business and, and your service lines. Sorry, and, and I kind of didn't mean to kind of interrupt you there, Shane. No, no, sorry, I stepped on you. No, I was going to, I was just going to add another layer on, on top of it. You know, everything that Heidi and uh, John had alluded to is, is also incorporating external 
stakeholders that you you rely upon in an event. You know, there's a lot of I've seen in a, in a, in a, in a host of different situations a lot of assumptions made about what the what someone else's capabilities are or are not, and that's built into the planning process and that's built into the in, 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 into the response. And all of a sudden, those expectations get shattered upon you know the, when the event happens. So bringing in you know your your external stakeholders that you rely on you know in the planning process, and then also testing it in an exercise environment to ensure that you know the plan is is accurate is uh, you know is really critical. And that includes you know suppliers, vendors, public safety agencies, all the folks that you would be you you can think of that you would be calling upon for assistance, or you you need their assistance to just to keep the lights on on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, it's great to bring them into this process as well. That's perfect. And yeah, you've really touched on uh, the importance of those exercises, conducting them, you know, in that environment before the incident actually happens. And then what you learn uh, from the exercises, um, different policies and processes. Uh, and Heidi, I believe you can touch on that. You have a checklist to go through. You bet. Um, so policies and processes, there's two different kinds of policies here. One is the policies that you need to have in place so that when something happens, you know what to do. And I think today I can say we know about instant response policy and plan, as well as disaster recovery business continuity. So what to do when the, you know, hits the fan and what to do, how to pick up pieces. <laughs> and so those are two policies. There's a lot of other policies we could talk about to really insulate and protect you, but we'll probably do that in another webinar more. And then there's also the other kind of policies we'll talk about, cyber policies. So most businesses that are you know, not terribly large don't have cyber insurance. Cyber insurance is actually a pretty good deal. I don't say that, I get nothing from cyber insurance, trust me. <laughs> but it's so important that you have coverage because like I said, so many companies go out of business within six months of having a cyber attack because of the expense, loss of goodwill, loss of customers, payment of fines and regulatory um, enforcement actions from your healthcare with HIPAA, things along those lines can really take a business down. Not to mention, so much of your team is diverted. <laughs> They're not doing their core function, right? Um, but there's also the need to have a policy in place. Do I pay ransom? How do I pay ransom? Can I pay ransom from inside my organization? And is there coverage for that payment of ransom? So you have to understand that's oftentimes covered by a cyber insurance policy. There's two different kinds of cyber crime, cyber insurance. Sometimes those cyber insurance policies can be written specifically for your type of risk. Healthcare, lots of personal information at play there. Protect PHI, protected health information. That gets out, you're gonna have to breach response. You're gonna have to send notifications. All of that can potentially be covered by a cyber policy, which is a great thing to have in place. It's money well spent when something has already happened. So the other part is like, I'll go a little bit through our checklist here that you'll get, you know, what's your first call? Well, obviously it's gonna be internal, right? And you should know everybody who's on that instant response team. It's not the whole world and it's not just IT. Contact your cyber counsel, somebody who you know can lead you through this event. Then you want to have that resource available to help put pieces together. You've already called Seamus. Um, we know and you know what his capabilities are. But you also need to call your cyber insurance carrier. Um, many policies are written in such a way that you have to have called them within a certain number of hours. And then some of you have... I can promise have policies that say who you can use for a lawyer, so be careful. And also that they will take over. Now, here's why that matters. If they decide to pay the ransom, you're probably gonna get hit again pretty quickly. So be careful with paying ransom. And, and law enforcement hates it when you pay the ransom, right? It encourages criminality. But when do you notify the FBI? When do you notify the Secret Service? I can tell you there's a disconnect over who says they should be notified on that. So, you know, when do you call Health and Human Services when you have a HIPAA breach? Local law enforcement, should you call them? And because there are 50 states and three territories, they each have their own privacy law that requires different things. Some of them require that you call the Attorney General for the state within 72 hours. And if you're 
company, does any business outside of the US in the EU, the time limit for breach of any personal information, which is much more than customers, it's also your internal employees and anybody you communicate with, is 72 hours. You must notify the authorities and all people involved. So there's a lot of things you need to know and it's not the time to get educated on it, it's before. So we'll give you the handy dandy checklist, but understanding what a cyber policy covers and what it doesn't cover is really um, complicated. So I would strongly suggest if you don't yet have a cyber policy that you look into one, but also know that your business policy is not gonna cover cyber. They have virtually always written that out of the policy. So understanding what that means. Um, I will tell you, I worked at a company that had every single one of, um, somebody pretended to be the CEO and called and said, I need all the, our employees, some 500 employees, W-2s right now. And of course, then everybody had their taxes filed. They could have, I would, so I, I would have loved it if they would have filed my taxes. But, <laughs> but so, you know, just an awful lot of identity fraud happens as a result of that. And there's a lot of liability for that. That would have been covered by the right policy. Back to you, Jake. So, thanks, Heidi. You know, and, you know, personally, with all of this, my head is kind of swimming. Like, I'm going to imagine, like, I'm the owner of a medium sized business and I'm hearing all of this and I'm just like, wow, how, how do I even get started? How do I pull my team together? And, you know, where, where's A, B, and C? And, you know, this answers a lot of the questions, but I, th I think, uh, you know, somebody like Seamus who has dealt with incidents like a hurricane, which is somewhat similar, you know, to a cyber attack because, you know, you're facing these damages. You've dealt with organizations and you've trained groups of people. I mean, can you speak a little bit on how you train groups of people, like if I'm in a small business or a medium-sized business, how do I get those that group together and motivated and help them understand the value of this training and the importance of it moving forward? Well, having a, a re, an incident response plan, whether again, for it's a hurricane or whether it's a cyber event, is, is a really a great first step for all the reasons that you know, we all went into for the last uh, few minutes. But you know, having everyone uh, trained that will implement that plan is really is key and you have to they have to know what will be expected of them you know in that plan and so that they can actually do it when the time comes you know there's too many times i've seen organizational plans that just sit on the shelf um you know most people don't most organizations i've seen you know when they, the event happens don't even know where their plan is let alone what's in it um it, you know an incident response plan is really doesn't it's, it's not supposed to tell an organization what to do when an event happens it's supposed to be a reference of what the team intends to do and that that sounds like word salad but it's an important distinction in that um it uh, the plan documents what you plan to do not not telling you what to do and if and if that's the case um everybody that on the team really needs to know what's contained in the plan and what their role is and the team members have to be trained and cross-trained on the roles that they're expected to play um, in order for them to be effective. And finally, and this is this is a this is a thing that's uh, often forgotten. The team members have to be empowered to actually act and do the jobs that you're asking them to do when the time comes. That they don't have to keep checking with everybody to make sure it's okay to actually do the functions that they do, especially in a cyber event when time is really not on your side. That everybody's got to be trained and everybody's got to have the ability to do what they need to do. Thank you. And you mentioned uh, that incident response plan, and that should be a hard copy rather than one that's sitting on the hard disk of a computer that has been locked. <laughs> I, I am, I am still old school enough emergency manager, but not only is it in the cloud, it's in the, you know, it's on my computer. It's, it's also printed out. And when I was a, a county emergency manager, I used to carry a dry erase pen so I could actually draw on the side of my truck if I needed to, to actually, you know, be, be as low, be as high tech as you can be to take advantage of society, all the, the technological wizardry of society, but also be as low tech as possible. And one other thing, Jake, I'll mention um, that, we do, that we didn't cover is we can't assume that these events are going to happen in a silo. 
that a cyber attack isn't going to be behind, it is going to happen after a, a natural disaster or an act of terrorism. These, these cyber adversaries tend to like to capitalize on other things that are going on. So you can't assume that it's going to happen on a sunny day at three o'clock in the afternoon on, on uh, September 30th. It could be three o'clock at three o'clock at night after a hurricane or, you know, Christmas Eve or whatever. So um, expect the worst, hope for the best. <laughs> Thanks, Seamus. Um, so it looks like uh, we just have a few more minutes left, about eight more minutes. Why don't we uh, just round things off with a few uh, closing remarks from each of our panelists. And then if there are any questions, uh, we'll address those. And if not, uh, we'll give you a few minutes back at the end of this. So let's start with uh, John. Do you have any closing remarks you'd like to leave our uh, folks with? Yeah, uh, thanks, Jake. So yeah, if, if there's one big takeaway for me, um, it, it's it's to always ask questions, um, right? You know, I think that, that people tend to look for a one size fits all solution. Um, and this is what you always do all the time. And that's not necessarily the case. Um, and so always ask the questions, um, you know, a few things too, other points, and you don't have to go it alone. Um, there are resources out there. There's resources like Heidi, uh, Seamus, Nuari to help in, in the pre-planning, what to do after. Um, you know, always, always ask yourself when you're asking those questions, what if, what if X happens? Um, and, and be imaginative when you think of those. You know, one thing that, that kind of keeps getting hit home to me over and over again is that, you know, businesses are running and they're, they're worried about profits. They're worried about the operations of their business. They're worried about HR. They're worried about you know, an infinitesimal number of different things, whereas hackers are only worried about one thing, um, and that's getting into your business. Um, and so, you know, be aware of that and, and just know that that's the environment that we're in now. Um, and again, you know, ask questions. If, you're, if you don't know the answer, find them. Create those, the, the environment that Seamus mentioned within your organization that, that it's okay to ask questions and, and it's okay to to find information and to challenge your organization, not just in IT or cyber, but it, but in all aspects. But you know, as we talk about cyber today, um, so yeah, that, that that's kind of it. it. And again, I don't know is always an acceptable answer because it spurs learning and it spurs um, practice and it spurs finding answers. Perfect. Thank you, John. We appreciate it. it. I'm gonna uh, ask Heidi now for her closing remarks. Yep. Um, Beth, most. Meaningful advice I think I could give is that C-level executives need to get invested in this process because without that leadership and guidance, things don't necessarily go that well. And when you have looked through the scenario and you have prepared for it, you're going to know who to call right away. And it's who you're going to call. That's to me, you know, your internal teams will have some direction on what they're supposed to be doing, but who are you going to go to? that's going to give you that external because if you don't have that in place beforehand, haven't talked to them, haven't said, okay, this would work out well. You seem like you'd work with us well. Um, it can be incredibly expensive if you make that step wrong. And I can tell you that, you know, I've been brought in where they made those steps wrong and it just costs so much more, or they brought in somebody who's just going to take it and run and you'll have no control over it. And then you get a bill and you just about fall over. So it's about under, and getting that trusted partnership now is so important. And, and preparation's cheap. I'm a thrifty person. <laughs> preparation's cheap. And it really will help you for small and medium businesses where you still need to maintain, you know, some continuity and, and profitability throughout the worst of times. It's good to be prepared. Wonderful. Thank you, Heidi. And with that, uh, uh, Seamus, it looks like you have the last couple of minutes before we open okay. the floor up to some possible okay. questions. I'll be quick, but I just like you know want to thank a uh, Nova Law Group and Nuari for help putting this uh, event together in you know, our inaugural webinar here. Um, <laughs> Um, and in particular, I'd like to thank Jake and Heidi and John for their, their help behind the scenes to put all this together. Um, but cybersecurity is an evolving threat in the 21st century. It's, it's really, as we stated earlier, it's not an IT problem. You know, cyber attacks have a significant impact in the physical world, as we saw at the Colonial Pipeline event. And these incidents are often attacks on our national security by smart and determined adversaries. Um, and as we move forward, we need to continue to break through organizational silos and work together to secure our future. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Seamus. And uh, uh, yes, I'd also uh, like to thank our panelists, Heidi and John and Seamus, um, and we appreciate everyone in the audience uh, today. I'd like to take just a second. Uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to type them into the chat box. Uh, or you can unmute yourself too. Yes, or you can unmute yourself. Uh, so I'll be quiet here for a second. And if no one says anything, then I'll start talking again. Okay, I think that was long enough. No one <laughs> unmuted themselves. So um, again, a uh, recorded version of this webinar uh, is being made and I will endeavor to uh, transmit the link out to everyone uh, so they can review this. Also, we will send out the checklist that we've referenced a few times and uh, we would all love to hear from you. Um, you can find us all on LinkedIn. Uh, we do have websites. Uh, the um, slide deck that I showed earlier did have our email addresses on. So feel free to write to us if you have any other questions uh, that you uh, did not have answered today. And uh, as a reminder, this is a first in a series of webinars that we hope to conduct uh, quarterly. Uh, and the upcoming and the subjects moving forward will be uh, decided upon later. <laughs> and so be looking for those on social and in your email box. And that is it. So thank you again for attending. And um, hopefully we'll see you during the next webinar. And everyone have a great rest of the week. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you guys so much. Thank you guys.